In Genesis 6, they saw some very spooky things. Okay? Uh, just a question to anybody out there. How, if you, and there's, I don't think there's going to be a wrong answer here. How tall do you think the tallest giant was in the days before the flood? How tall do you think they could have been? 20 feet, my wife says. 26 feet. Now that's pretty, um, that's a pretty interesting answer. That's not like, because my wife just out of the air, 20 feet. Okay, but you had, you're like playing her on, on um, Price is Right. 26 feet. Yeah, one dollar. <laughs> what makes you say 26 feet? Where'd they find it in France? Working in an Amazon warehouse, I believe. Hmm. 20 feet, 26 feet. It's, I believe it's possible. I really do. Um, man, I was going to show you the footprint tonight, and I forgot all about it. There is in, in South Africa, uh, on the side of a stone cliff is a footprint, a giant footprint. And um, the footprint itself is, I'm going to guess, about five feet long. It is it five, did I guess right? Five feet long? Okay. Um, what size man would fit into a five foot, I'm, I wear a size 10 shoe, that's it, size 10 shoe, I, I have little feet for my size, my son, how long, how big was dad's feet, 12 and a half, why didn't I get that, because I got your feet, so my son Matthew wore what, a 14, 13, yeah, so I got little feet for my size. But how, I wonder how tall, a f if a man had a five foot foot, what's the ratio? How tall will he be? 26 feet. You guys are working together. I don't like this. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. I, um... Friday night in Pea Ridge, Arkansas, in a room full of Arkansasiers, um, I taught them about the gods of the Old Testament and uh, used that to, and I gave them all the scriptures of the gods, and then I showed various pictures that people have drawn in ancient times of these various gods. And um, then I used that to segue into dealing with unidentified flying objects. And um, I, I, don't, I, I told them, I said, I don't, I'm not telling you you have to believe this. If you've never seen one, fine. If you have seen one, maybe you don't want to tell anybody you've seen one. But other people have. And I said the important thing to remember is the thing that hath been in the Bible is the thing that shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. So to understand the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, certain prophecies in the Bible, to try to understand them without the context of the whole Bible you're going to miss something. You're not going to understand what's really going to happen. So this is, this is important. It is, I think, highly important pertaining to the time that we live in. Um, so the question I would ask tonight is, could it be possible that man could create giants once again? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. It's possible. Very possible. With the genetic um, things that are going on. By the way, the coronavirus, a virus is a bundle of DNA. It's RNA. It's single strand. It's basically a bundle of code like DNA that has one purpose in, in its existence. Its only purpose is to find a host and reproduce itself and kill the host. That's its purpose. God put those in this world. And they have different ways of masking themselves and so on, covering themselves up. And the coronavirus, for everything that we can see, was not a natural virus. It was manufactured. It was created by man. It was a sort of a repurposing of a different virus. Okay? And they're playing it out, you know, the news media is making this a big thing and so on. Um, they're telling us that normal people who are not presently ill or in some bad condition, you'll survive. It's the people who already have pre-existing lung conditions or that are very weak because of age or some other sickness. They're the ones who are dying. But just normal people aren't. But what if... What if a virus was, was created and let go that didn't just make you sick, that absolutely would kill you? That's something to worry about. And it could, it could very well be biblical. But Genesis 6, verse 1, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, meaning after the flood, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So I want to, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look a little bit more at the biology of the giants, and then we're going to look at the issue of who the sons of God were and who they were not, according to scriptures, in order to understand this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do ask your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us, for your mercy. And Father, we always get far better than we deserve, and Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, we just ask and pray, God, that you guide us in our spirits, help us, give us understanding, Lord, in our souls, and comprehension, fill us with your seven spirits, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and help us, dear God, to have a healthy fear of you, and help us to know you for who you really are. Open up your word to us and help us to understand things that have been because we believe that these things also will be. So Lord, teach us out of your word, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Now, I had mentioned this earlier that up in Alton, Missouri, there was a man by the name of Robert Wadlow, um, I know this because things like in the Guinness Book of World Record was always my fascination. Anything that was the extreme, the biggest, the tallest, the fattest, the smallest, or whatever, I always wanted to know that. And up in Alton, they called him the Alton Giant. His name was Robert Wadlow. And um, by the time he was 19 years old, he was already well over 8 feet tall, and he was still growing. Um, obviously, somebody that tall, if he played basketball, all he would have to do was stand next to the net and put it in there. Um, Robert Wadlow went to work, was hired by the Brown Shoe Company, and he had a man that would drive him 
from town to town because Brown Shoe Company custom made shoes for Robert Wadlow and gave them to him for free in exchange for him going from town to town to shoe stores that sold brown shoes and the and the the shoe store would make a big deal out of this people would come from all over the county to see this guy Robert Wadlow and uh, he would talk about the brown shoe company how they made him these huge shoes to wear and he would say these are the best shoes in the world and so brown shoe company paid him a salary drove him around and made shoes for him and that's what he did he used what he had to make his living There's nothing wrong with that uh, but you would think okay this guy must have been an incredible basketball player a mean I mean he could whip anybody but his problem was his size he was clumsy he wasn't he wasn't proportioned with a muscular build he was just tall was what he was and he didn't live but in his early 20s I can't remember exactly what age he died what he had was he had something on his pituitary gland that caused him to just keep growing at the time he died he was measured at eight feet eleven and three quarter inches so why not just say nine feet because that's what he was nine feet tall and he was still growing had he lived he would have gotten taller okay but how he died was he because of the weight and and because of his size his ankles and his knees would not hold up so he had to wear a brace around his ankles to help his ankles hold up that weight now you don't see any of you don't see Og or Goliath wearing braces and coming out in crutches and with a walking stick they you don't see that so and and what happened was the brace wasn't fitted properly and as he walked around in it it rubbed into his leg which caused an infection and he died from that infection but the bottom line was he was not like one of these biblical giants because his ratio and his proportion to his height was not normal okay so this is not what we see in the Bible we see these giants in the Bible that number one are incredibly strong they do not need braces and crutches and walking canes to walk around with and they're not circus events these men were kings because of their not just their height but their girth the muscular build that they have and I would also say because of their parentage that their mental capacity would have been something tremendous as well they were not just giants in size they were giants in IQ so Deuteronomy 311 tells us the tremendous size for only Og king of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants behold his bedstead was a bedstead of iron is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits the breadth thereof so his bed frame was 13 feet six inches long six feet wide so picture me being Og's width if I was sideways that's how big sideways he was to have a bed that's six feet wide that's how big he was so again we're not just dealing with something wrong with their growth plates that's making them grow abnormally we're talking something way way bigger than that uh, we mentioned this I believe the last time Goliath nine feet tall spearhead weighed approximately 15 pounds a coat of mail weighed approximately 125 pounds um, 
Numbers 13, 28, the people be strong. The cities are walled and very great. We looked at some of their walls that still exist. Uh, Numbers 13, 32, they were men of great stature. Verse 33, there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which came of the giants. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight. Grasshopper. The size of a human, let's say five feet, 10 inches up against a giant. If it's a ratio, those giants were tremendous size. If, if one of the spies stood next to the giant and the size of the man up against the giant was the ratio of a grasshopper to us, can you imagine how big those giants were? You could probably do the math. You could find out how tall a grasshopper, take the biggest grasshopper you can find, find out, let's say it's, let's say it's two inches high. Take that measurement up against a man that's, say, five feet, ten inches, so that would be 70 inches. The ratio is two inches to 70 inches. Okay, there's your ratio, or 70 to 2. So do the math on that. Anybody that's good at math and good at ratios, and when you've got the number, how many feet tall the giant would have been if the man was the ratio of a 2-inch grasshopper, 70 inches to 2 inches, do the math on it. Okay, you working on that? I think she is, because she didn't answer me. 2 Samuel 21, 16, Ish Bibinab, uh, his spearhead weighed 300 shekels of brass, that's seven and a half pounds. Your Bible may some, say something different, 2 Samuel 21, uh, the brother of Goliath the Gittite, his staff was like a weaver's beam, and he had six fingers and six toes, four and twenty in number. He also was born to the giant. So we're talking genetically, there's something very, very different about them. And this is why God hates them. There is a reason why God hates them. There is a reason why God wanted them all dead. Okay, so they're genetically unique. If we go back to Numbers 13, we, we read that one cluster of grapes was so large that it had to be carried by two men. So, what was going on with these giants? If you have giants, you must have a lot of food for these giants. The tallest one could pick up a cow, eat it like you would eat a fish stick, okay? In Genesis 6, verse 12, Notice what is said. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So something else happened that corrupted all the, all the animals, all the living creatures that were on the earth. Something else I think was going on which is why God wanted it destroyed he had to destroy it he had to cleanse water is a cleansing agent even in the Bible so he had to cleanse the earth of this what he called this corruption off of the earth he wanted it all dead primarily though I think number one uh, the way man had corrupted, number two, the presence of these giants. And God wanted them all dead, wanted them all killed. So it's probably why we saw earlier you have pyramids, very large pyramids made out of very large stones that are 10, 20, 30 meters under the sea. They weren't built that way. At one point, they were built on land, and they got flooded. They, I believe they're the remnants of 
what happened in Genesis chapter 7. So now, if there was something genet genetically different about these giants, they were not just kind of tall people that were very mean. Tall, by tall, I'm saying six and a half feet, or maybe six feet, ten inches. They were not just a little bit tall and a lot mean. There was something genetically and significantly different about these giants. So what, what was their parentage? Who are the sons of God? So back in Genesis 6, we have it mentioned twice. Verse 1, it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Then again in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. I've gotten into arguments with preachers years ago. I, and which is why I, I generally, I just don't like doing it. I don't like arguing. It doesn't serve a purpose. Because if somebody's got their mind made up, they are not going to listen no matter what you say. So, it was, Mom, it was a preacher at camp. And I brought up something about the giants and the sons of God. And he said, oh, come on. You don't believe that stuff about the sons of God being angels. And I just said, he was very, he was automatically right away, very antagonistic. And I said to him, can you show me? I said, do you believe they were the children of Seth, the sons of God? He said, absolutely. I said, can you show me in the Bible? He said, yes. And I went, where? It's in there. What kind of answer is that? Right, it's a whoo! Now get off my back. It's a mean bark, and I don't know the answer. But he said, it's in there. I said, read it to me. Then he starts being antagonistic again. And you people, you're getting that from the book of Enoch, and he's telling me what I, what I believe. No, I asked a question. Where is it in the Bible that it says that the sons of God were the generation of Seth and the daughters of men were the wicked generation of Cain? And I said, even at that, how does that produce men of great stature? Because lost people marry saved people all the time and no giants were ever born from that union. It's never happened. So explain to me why you believe this. Explain to me why nobody would fight Goliath. Explain this to me. And then they start calling you names, and then you know they're talking about you behind your back, and all this stuff. So we go to the scriptures. We go, let's travel through the Old Testament. The next place we find sons of God is in Job. So in Job 1... Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. So we, have, we know that this was a gathering of angels. Then Satan, oh, you're having a meeting. I must have left my invitation in the mailbox. Right? Right? Because, I mean, he's meeting all the sons of God. Satan just shows up there. What, 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 you, guys, what you guys have a meeting? What, was you going to tell me about it? He wants in on it. So, there are angels. In verse 1 of chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Again, two references in the beginning of the book of Job. And it appears that they are of the heavenly realm. Now, turn, in fact, turn to Job 38. Go ahead and take your Bible, turn there. Job 38, because Job 38 requires just a little bit of explanation. 
God, God is uh, going to, he's going to educate Job. He's going to deal with him. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, and I will demand of thee the answer thee. Where wast thou, Job? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. And what God is doing, he's reminding Job of who he is. I'm God. I laid the foundations of of the earth where were you you weren't here i did that so the question where was thou when plays into verse seven when where was thou job when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of god shouted for joy so now in this verse he's directly connected the sons of god to the stars. So the sons of God are of the heavenly realm, not the earthly realm. So if I, if I was talking to somebody, trying to explain this, at this point, they would then raise the objection and say, okay, if that's true, then... How come they were allowed to marry because Jesus said that they do not marry? Okay, and there is an answer to that. Uh, Numbers 24. This is still connected to the idea of who the stars are. Are. We have to identify the stars. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Who's the star of Jacob? Who do you think it is? It's Jesus. It's a capital S, so we know it's Jesus. Jesus is, Jesus de described himself in Revelation 22 as, I am the root and offspring of David, and the bride and morning star. 2 Peter 1, verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Jesus is the day star. So stars are of the heavenly angelic realm. Amos 5, 26, There are evil Stars, you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. Acts 7, 43 quotes this verse and says, Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. So now we have evil stars. Moloch, Remphan, uh, Rimphan and Chiyun are Saturn. So in Revelation 9, we have the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him, him, a star, was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he, the star, took the key and opened the bottomless pit. So this star is actually like a living entity it's alive because it took the key and when it got to the door the bottomless pit it unlocked the door opened the door and let these locusts out then revelation 12 this is where this is where it becomes future something's going to happen a bad day for everybody. If you think this world is evil and possessed with devils now, wait. It's about to get worse. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, his tail 
to the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then in verse 7, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. So I'm telling you that angels and stars are the same thing. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Daniel 8, 10. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Them is a, like a human. They have a living nature. The stars do. The host and the stars. The heavenly host are the angels. Stars are the angels. There was a movie made about this. Jeff Bridges, when he was young, and it was called Star Man. Anybody ever seen that? Okay, so it's about a man or a entity from the heavens and he crashes and falls to the earth and he roams around and gathers the DNA of Jeff Bridges' character who died and takes his DNA and builds a body out of it. So now he is the resurrected whoever Jeff, the character Jeff Bridges played. And he's at his wife's house who's watching a movie of her and her husband frolicking around and she's drinking wine and all of a sudden here comes the image of her husband standing in front of her, buck naked, and she passes out. But the bottom line is that he is a star man who fell from the sky. The government's looking for him, of course, obviously. And he's going to go back into the heavens, but he does something before he does. Remember what he does? He makes a baby. He makes a baby. And he tells the woman that her child is going to be a great teacher on this planet. That's what he said. Where do they write these scripts from? How do they, where do they get their ideas from? They are inspired, but not by God. Okay? So, we have the Bible, the devil has Hollywood. Okay? Um... Stars as the host of heaven, Deuteronomy 4, 19. Uh, when thou seest the sun, the moon, the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them. Deuteronomy 17, 3. Had gone and served other gods and worshiped them, either the sun or moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded. Uh, in 2 Kings 3, 23, 5. Thou hast burned incense unto Baal, to the sun, and to the... I don't know what happened to the rest of the verse, but it says the host of heaven. So stars are the host of heaven. Jeremiah 19, 13, burned incense unto all the host of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto other gods. So now he's calling the host of heaven the gods. The gods are the host of heaven and they are the stars and they are the sons of God. Now, uh, there's one more verse. I don't have it on the screen. I want you to turn to Psalm 82. Is it warm in here to anybody but me? Can we turn a little air on? Psalm 82. Underline this passage. Because this really identifies the fact that the gods are the sons of God. Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods... 
and all of you are children of the Most High. That, to me, says it in almost no uncertain terms. There's really no way, now you can make that a metaphor if you want. It's, a, it's an interesting symbol, but it's literal. It means what it says. Just as Adam was called the Son of God in Luke 3, even though he was created, so were the angels. So if Adam could be called the Son of God, and God created Adam, God created the angels, and he called them sons of God. Now, that's the Old Testament. The Old Testament, every time it uses the phrase sons of God, they are angels. Now the New Testament is slightly different. Because every time the New Testament uses the phrase sons of God, it's us. It's us. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So it's us. For as many, Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So what Romans 8, 19 is telling us is that we are, are designated sons of God, but we're waiting for the manifestation of that. So, Courtney's baby shower today. You already know it's a girl. Have you got a name picked out? Okay, so, even though the baby's not born, is the baby not the daughter of Courtney? Right? The baby is the daughter of Courtney. But we don't know what she'll look like. We don't know if she'll look like Liam or Roland. Gwen's going. <laughs> or maybe she'll be pretty as Gwenny. She's nodding her head, yes. So you understand that. That child right now is the daughter of Courtney and Todd. And there is nobody that can take that away. But she hasn't been manifested yet. Right? She's waiting for the manifestation, which is the birth. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now take that verse... And think about who the sons of God were in the Old Testament. Sons of God in the Old Testament were the stars, the angels, and they shine as lights in the world. And Philippians 2 says that now we are the sons of God who will shine as lights in the world. So now the New Testament and the Old Testament are telling you the exact same thing. Because when we die and we are taken up into heaven, Jesus said that we would be like who? Who would we be like? Close. We would be like who? The angels. 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, turn to Matthew and Mark. Turn to Matthew. I want you to see this. This, this is important. Matthew 22, Matthew 22, verse 29, 
because they brought up the question, according to the law of Moses, if a man marries a wife and the man dies before the wife gives birth or has a child, then by law the man's brother had to take this woman, conceive in her, so that her child would be the inheritor of the first husband. He would inherit the first husband's land. So they go through this, they come up with this way of trying to trip Jesus up. So what if a woman runs through all seven brothers and does not produce any seed when she's in heaven, who's going to be her husband in heaven? The first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, or the seventh one. Which one? Which guy gets to have her in heaven? And that's where Jesus said, You do err not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Very important how he said that. There is we in the resurrection are going to be as the angels of God in heaven. And the only marriage that'll be is us with Jesus. Then Mark 12. Look at how he says it. Mark 12, 24. Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not Therefore err, because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. He says it twice. The angels which are in heaven. So, now, we have the statement by Jesus that the angels... In heaven, do not marry, nor are given in marriage. Remember in Matthew 24, when they asked him about the end times, when shall, what shall the sign be? He said, they shall marry and be given in marriage. As it was in the days, for in the days before Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. That's what Jesus said. What's interesting to me is that the only marrying taking place in the Bible before the flood was the sons of God taking the daughters of men to be their wives. That's the only one you see. Only marriages. Okay? So, how do we, how do we then say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 were angels when... God made a restriction that the angels in heaven cannot take a wife and be married. How can we say that the sons of God are angels and they took them wives of all which they chose? How can we say that? Because that's the, that's the argument that I got from everybody I've ever talked to that didn't believe this. They would say... Hoggard, you're wrong because we know angels can't marry. And besides that, they don't have bodies. Okay? So that's really the two things that I, that I heard. They don't have bodies, so that's stupid. Plus, they can't marry, so you're stupid. And I'm not. Okay? So, how can we reconcile that? We'll do it next Sunday night. I won't tell you tonight. I won't tell you. You're not going to know. Unless you find it yourself. You can find it yourself. All the clues that you need are right here in this book. Okay? So next Sunday night, I'm going to make you show up. I'm going to make you show up, Jaden. Okay? Let's stand to our feet.
Father, we do certainly ask for your blessings always. And Lord, we are blessed above measure. And we thank you for it. Lord, I don't understand everything in this book. I don't understand every chapter. But Lord, I want to learn. I'm here to learn. There's more that I don't know than what I do know. So Father, what I don't know, help me to seek. Like the days that you gave me years ago, when I sought out your word, when I searched it diligently, I looked for things like they were buried treasures, and I didn't stop until I found them. Father, I yearn for those days back because I love your word. I love the hidden treasures that are in it. So, Father, fill us all with wisdom from your word, with knowledge and understanding because I think these things matter. And I believe they matter to this generation because I do believe this generation is the last. So, Father, if we're the last, then everything in this Bible is relevant. Every bit of it is relevant for the days we live in. So give us all a hunger for knowing what this Bible says. We were told to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. And Father, some days I don't think I qualified for that. But Lord, I want to. I want to study to show myself approved. So open up my eyes, my ears, my heart, and help us all, Father, to study, to seek out the matter the way kings do, to unravel the mysteries that are in here until we're satisfied that we know what you said. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen.